Cliff is really good. I thought he was going to say, if you want to buy one of these orange uh, uh, T-shirts, you can be a construction worker or you can work. Such a privilege to have Joel Rosenberg back, back, back with us. Uh, yesterday morning, we've got uh, a blog where... Uh, Joel had lost a very dear friend, so just pray for Joel and his family, and uh, Joel will let you know a little bit about it, but uh, why don't you welcome with me Joel Rosenberg, and you can be seated. Good evening joy to be with you guys again. The topic we've been talking about the last, uh, well, Monday night and now today. But I want to just restate it for those of you who perhaps were not here for that. We talked about why many pastors and Bible teachers are not teaching Bible prophecy. Uh, prophecy is such a, an enormous portion of the scriptures, and yet many pastors and ministry leaders are not teaching Bible prophecy. And there were four reasons I mentioned. First, because many have a lack of belief in the power of God's word. Many have a lack of belief in the power of God's word. They The second reason that many Bible uh, teachers and uh, pastors do not teach Bible prophecy is that they have a lack of knowledge of or training in Bible prophecy. Prophecies are challenging sometimes. It takes a little while to, to you have to really study these things and, 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 and sift through them and compare scripture with scripture and, and put it in context, historical context, uh, biblical context. Uh, and, try, and really try to sift these things out. Some of these prophecies, for example, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, they mention nations that have funny names. Uh, one of them is called Gomer. That is not where Gomer Pyle is from. Okay. Some of the nations are uh, the same names that we use today, but many of them are not. And so you have to do some historical detective work. And if you're a pastor or, or, or Bible teacher uh, who has not had the time or interest in studying those things carefully, uh, then people can be intimidated and therefore they just don't teach it at all. The third reason that why many pastors and Bible teachers don't teach prophecy is that they have a fear of being lumped in with prophecy nuts and those who peddle sensationalism. Now, that fear is good. I mean, fear is bad, generally speaking, but, but a desire to not be lumped in with nuts, I, I, I'm for that. Um, the people of New Mexico, Area 51 feel to it. It's just a little too excited, you know? and. Uh, it makes people uncomfortable. And so if a person's trying to teach and, and, and the whole counsel of God, but they feel like the people who teach prophecy are sensationalistic or they're date setters and they're saying, oh, I know the exact day and hour or any of that, then they don't want to be lumped in with that. And that's the right thing. But to not teach Bible prophecy because some people teach it badly is a mistake, right? People teach the gospels badly. Uh, they teach the Old Testament badly. There's a lot of things that, pe that people teach badly about the Bible, but that's not a reason. Understanding of the times in which we live. They don't realize, for whatever reason, that we are actually getting closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
And they don't realize, for example, that the second coming of Christ really comes in two parts. First is Christ coming for his church. That's the rapture. And then he comes with his church. That's the actual, literal, physical second coming of Christ where he literally lands on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, breaking that mountain in half, and he sets up his kingdom to reign over the earth. But there And that we should both be excited about it and preparing our hearts for it and preparing those that we shepherd and lead to be ready themselves. And so because they don't understand these things, they're not gripped by how exciting but also how sobering that is, should Christ come and we not be ready, they don't teach him. So those are four reasons why many pastors and Bible teachers don't teach Bible prophecy. Tonight I want to make four different points, but ones that build off of that. We talked about prophecy on Monday. Uh, we talked about those things, and we talked uh, in, in specific about some prophecies that deal with the Middle East. That we I hope you do, and you're cooking some up. If you have some cues, I'll try to offer some A's. But I want to make four points tonight. Well, tonight we're going to focus primarily on the United States. We're not going to focus primarily on the Middle East, though I'm happy to take a few of those type of questions during the Q&A, but we're going to focus tonight on our country, on the United States of America. And, and in this context, I want to make four points. The first is, and if you're taking notes, I'll, I'll, I'll go slow, I'll repeat as much as I can, or you can buy the, you know, the code and, and, and get, it, get it next week. So the first point is that the Bible is not shy. Let me restate that. The Bible is not shy about describing itself as the word of the all-seeing, all-knowing, almighty God of the universe. Now this is a critically important point because God himself describes himself through his word, through the Bible, as knowing everything, as seeing everything as having all authority and power, and therefore his word can be trusted. Therefore, when he says something's going to happen in the future, he's not spitballing. God knows it's going to happen. He can already see the future. Now, how does he do that? I have absolutely no idea. And that's one of the things we mentioned on Monday. If you're, if you're studying Bible prophecy, if you're teaching Bible prophecy, one of the phrases that's really important for you to become comfortable with is the phrase, I don't know. Because there's an awful lot about God that we just simply do not understand and that we have to take by faith. But the Bible describes God as seeing all, of knowing all. And let me give you some passages that... that, that is where we get that from. For example, in Isaiah chapter 42, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah. This is what we read from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. And he says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. The, just TiVo that for a second. He's making a, a point of distinction. He's the living God. He's the true God. He's the powerful God. He's not a piece of clay. He's not, a, he's not an idol. He's not a, a piece of rock or stone. You guys, of course, live here in Hawaii, so you probably don't watch 
uh, the ancient episode of... Uh, of uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, well, you may not know the story, but you might want to look that back up and, and note that we do not want to be focusing on idols. We do not want to believe in graven images of things that we have created or others have created thinking that they have power, thinking that they have control over us, thinking that they can tell us the future, either good or bad. God is making a distinction. He said, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them. Future. Not guess, but how can he know the future? Because he's all seeing. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. That is who our God is. That's who the Bible describes our God to be. Now, if you look just a few pages later to Isaiah chapter uh, 44, beginning in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And there is no God besides me. Who is like me, the Lord says. Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. Again, the Lord is describing himself as the only true God, as the only God who can see the future. And he says, if, look, if there's some other being that wants to stand up and say he's God, great. Let him declare the things that are coming. And let those things come true. You can't just say these things are coming. You have, to, you have to be accurate. You have to be right. In fact, in the Old Testament, if a prophet came along and told you something, a false prophet, and it was incumbent upon the people of Israel to stone and to kill that prophet for being a deceiver. Now, that system changes in the New Covenant. We're not supposed to go around stoning people uh, for disobeying God, okay? Now, if you lived in the 60s getting stoned, maybe that was perceived as a good thing. It wasn't then either, but, but, but that, we're under the New Covenant. We're not under the law of Moses. We're under what the Apostle Paul calls the law of Christ. So just to be clear, uh, there, will, there are many false messiahs, false prophets, false teachers out there. We need to have uh, love and compassion, but we, 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 I, don't, I want to be clear with you not to go out and stone them. Okay, just, so I don't want And that the Bible is the only truth. If you turn then to chapter 46 of Isaiah, God is really making himself clear through the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. Chapter 46. Beginning in verse 9. The Lord says this. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times now think about that again this is who God says that he is 
This is a God who declares the end from the beginning. He can tell you who wins the race. Now, don't get, you know, thinking, oh, I like to bet on the horses. That's not a good thing. And God's not going to help you with that because that's wrong. But anyway, but he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how the story is going to end. Why? Because he's an author. In fact, he's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller of all time. And he knows how the book is written. He knows how it ends. And actually, we know how it ends, too, because we have the last chapter. Now, we don't know every single detail of how the book of Revelation, for example, is going to play out. Out of Isaiah, for example, and, and show you some other uh, passages, turn with me to the, uh, the minor prophet Amos. Minor only that he wrote a small amount. The Lord wrote a small amount through him, uh, not that he's not significant or important. In Amos chapter 3, the Lord says something very you know, fascinating to me. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. That's an amazing verse. Let me read it again. Amos chapter clear and to put that in the context of all scripture. In other words, he does nothing that he perceives as so significant that he wants people to know in advance without telling the prophets so that they can put it on the record so that we can go to this and say, okay, these are some of the things that the Lord said would happen in the future. That's an amazing thing and, and that, that God wants to give us a glimpse of the future. He wants us to come to him and he's willing to share some of the future with us. Now, he doesn't talk about all events at all times in all countries. But he does talk about key, critical, significant events in some countries. second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, he gives us prophecies related to the millennial kingdom and then to uh, events that will happen after that too. But most of these things are things that are coming. And that's really an extraordinary thing that God is making this clear. And so when you approach scripture, realize that you're reading a book by a God who knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows every hair on your head, unless you don't have any, and he knows that too. Right? He knows when you were born, he knows how you were born. He knit you together, the Bible says, in your mother's womb. He, he, he took care in every detail. Now, how, do, how does all that happen? I don't know. I don't know how he not only makes each one of us, he loves us anyway. Let's be clear. What he has seen is our life often displeasing him and disobeying him and rejecting him for long stretches of our lives. Some of you much longer than others, but, but, the, but we've all, like sheep, gone astray. And yet the Lord, seeing all that, even the sins we have and will commit after coming to Christ, he, he still says, and I love you and I'm going to save you anyway, even knowing the things that you have done that you will do. He knows all of that. And he loves us. And that ought to be sobering if we have not received Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's exciting. That's good news. That's who our God is. And that he knows our individual future. And we read through the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11, He says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for harm. Plans to give you a future and a hope. God has an amazing plan for your life. If you will 
seek him and follow him and give your life to Jesus Christ. He will guide you into that future. Now, that doesn't mean your future will be easy. He's not offering you all the riches and power of the universe. He may actually be taking... relationship with the God of the universe that clears away, washes away every sin we've ever done, that we ever will do, and ad he adopts us into his family. He receives us into his family to make us our, a, a child of him, of the king of the universe. That's an amazing thing. And, 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 he's, and then sometimes he says, I, I, I need you to make a decision. Are you willing to give up everything here? so that you can have eternal life. It's a free gift, but it's not easy. There, there's a cost to serving Jesus Christ. And we have to make a decision. serve a God who doesn't know the future. I don't want to serve a God who, who, who doesn't have power over the future, who doesn't have a plan and purpose for my life. I don't want that kind of God. I don't want a piece of wood or stone or some other graven image. I want the true God. He knows me. I want to know him. I want to be adopted into his family, and I've made that decision, and I hope that if you haven't, that by the end of tonight you will, and that if you have made that decision, that you'll, you'll be spending this evening, as, as you listen to me talk, processing, am I giving Jesus everything? If he's this amazing, if he's this powerful, am I willing to give everything I am and everything I have to him so that he can guide me? describing itself as the word of the almighty, all-seeing, all-knowing God of the universe. That's point number one. Point number two. Fulfilled prophecies are one of the ways that we know that God's word is true. Let me say that again. Fulfilled prophecies, prophecies that have already come true, biblical prophecies, these are one of the ways, one of the most powerful ways that we know that the Bible is true. And, and the more I study the Bible prophecy, the more fascinated I am and the more secure I get. You better be sure that Jesus is the one who can get you to heaven, right? If you say, I'm going to follow Jesus and not Muhammad, you better be sure that it's Jesus who's going to get you to heaven and that you're not going to wind up dead one day and realizing, uh-oh, I made a mistake. And Bible prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy, is one of the most powerful ways that we know that God's word is true because there's no other book, no other religious text, that, that uses prophecy as a proof. You know, you think about the prophet Muhammad, right? That's how he's described in Islam. But you'd be hard pressed to kind of think of any prophecies that he spoke of. Because he didn't really say things to predict the future. Jesus, of course, was more than a prophet because a prophet is a man who, uh, whom God has spoken his word to to share with the people. Jesus is God. And so he, uh, he, wasn't, you know, he wasn't giving himself the words of God so that he could speak to others. He, he, he is the word of God who became flesh. Some of the, uh, just a few examples, but there's so many of them. And I hope that you'll get excited and intrigued to study Bible prophecy on your own and to share that with others in your Bible study, in, in, in any other, in your family, in any other context. But, you know, just a few of them, for example. I love the prophet Daniel. He's one of my favorites. And Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9,
He's studying the, the prophet Jeremiah. And he's got the scroll of Jeremiah open, and he's like, all right, well, this, okay, Lord, let me, teach me something new today. I'm so excited. Your word is so amazing. Now, here's a, here's a man of God who, who, who ended up being told to write Scripture, but he's studying Scripture. And what does he find? He's like, oh, my gosh. He comes to Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, verses just a few verses before the ones I just described about God having a great plan for our lives. And he's reading through Jeremiah 29, and he discovers that God had not only said that the Jewish people who were living in exile in Babylon, of which Daniel and his friends were among them, but that they would be returned Now, somehow, this had, he had never been taught this. And Daniel was a pretty bright guy, right? And, 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 but there weren't a lot of people around studying Bible prophecy. They weren't, there weren't a lot of people around teaching Bible prophecy. He was studying it on his own, and he was already a, a, an ordained prophet of God. But he studied Jeremiah 29, and he discovered, lo and behold, God had specifically said that the Jewish people would come back from exile after 70 years. And he realized that 70 years, it's like, oh, wow, check the calendar, uh, get his iPod out, uh, iPhone, and oh, wow, that's coming up fast. And that electrified him. But it also... They weren't talking about it. They weren't teaching it. And yet God had been so specific. Now, he could have, of course, been one of those people who was reading through Jeremiah 29 and said, okay, God says, uh, well, you know, all the Jewish people will return in 70 years. Well, obviously he didn't mean 70 years. Let's not be ridiculous. That's sort of in a while, right? He, maybe, what, if, what if Jeremiah thought, well, he, God doesn't mean 70. He, he, he doesn't, he's not being specific about that. He's just saying someday. Well, he probably wouldn't have gotten so excited or begin to pray and beg and plead for forgiveness for himself and his people that they had been so far from God that they didn't even realize this amazing truth. Because study the prophecies, the ones that have already come true, and the ones that are coming true, and the ones that will come true. It's, it's a transforming way to study scripture when you begin to realize that God is moving. It's not static. He's saying something that will happen, and then it happens. Let me give you one other example. There's so many, and I love them all, but I, you know, tonight's not about all, teaching all the prophecies that ever happened in the Bible, because you know, that would take too long. Well, how, how much time do you have? No, okay, we won't do them all tonight. <laughs> But another one I love is the Lord tells Isaiah that there's going to be a future leader in Persia, and that Persian leader is going to be... ...tell Isaiah the exact name of the future king who's going to rise up in Persia. That name was Cyrus. Now, not Miley Cyrus, kids. No, Cyrus. He was a king of Persia. And uh, what's amazing is more than a hundred years later, there was a king that emerged who just, you know, just happened to be called Cyrus. And lo and behold, he decided he was going to release the Jewish people and help them get back home. God is amazing. He didn't say it's going to be Fred Flintstone and then it happened to be Cyrus, right? He didn't say it was going to be Cyril and it happened to be Cyrus. He didn't say it All-powerful God. And I, I want to ask you something. Do you, do you know this God? Are you getting to know this God? 
Fulfilled prophecies are one of the ways that we know that God's word is true. And did you realize that there are about a thousand prophecies in the Bible? Do you realize that more than half of them, more than 500 of the prophecies between Genesis and Revelation have already come true? And most of the remainder take place between now, literally this moment, and the second coming of Christ. There are some prophecies, as we mentioned, that happen after the second coming and deals with the millennial kingdom. lifetime. You're like, okay, that's all fascinating with Cyrus, and you know, and okay, now it's not my lady Cyrus, and okay, and it's all fascinating about Daniel and the 70 years, but that's a long time ago. I mean, God, that was, maybe God moved then powerfully, but he doesn't move that way now, does he? Yes. Yes, he does. Have you ever heard of a country called um, Israel? <laughs> okay. You, you, have everyone heard? That? Okay, so so Israel was reborn as a country, right? It was an old country, a, a Bible country, right? But then, oh, you know, suddenly it came back to life as a country, a legal entity on this planet, on May 14th, 1948. Uh, and in my, my new book, Implosion, I, I have a whole chapter about this. But let me just cite Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37. Those are the famous, I would say the most famous chapters that say that in the last days of history, Israel will be physically reborn. It will be resurrected out of, out of a dead you know, nation of Israel. It will be, the nation of Israel will be reborn. Jews will come back to the Holy Land after centuries of exile... And they'll make the deserts bloom again with God's help. They'll rebuild the ancient ruins with God's help. And, you know, people for about 1,900 years, why would you believe that the Bible means what it says when it says that Israel will be reborn in the future, in the last days. That, that, that's ridiculous. Nobody believes that. Jews are not going to come back to the Holy Land. They're scattered all over the planet, and there's no way it's ever going to happen. That's what people said for almost 1,900 years. And I'm not talking about pagans. I'm talking about the church fathers. Not all of them, but most, I would certainly many, and I would argue most of the church fathers for nearly 1,900 years thought that it wasn't true. That, but why? Because for the first 500 years after the, you know, this, this Okay, that was all then, but, but you don't literally believe that the Ezekiel 36 and 37 are going to come true, do you? I mean, and if you were a literalist and say, yeah, I, I do believe that's what's going to happen. 500 years go by and you're like, you know, the, the skeptics are like, well, you're not sticking with that, are you? I mean, you know, grow up. Obviously, you're misinterpreting. This is a metaphoric point. It's a symbolic point. God has replaced Israel He's done with the Jewish people. They rejected Jesus. Now God has rejected them. And therefore, every time you see Israel and some prophecy about Israel in the Bible, just take that word Israel and replace it in your mind. Israel's not going to come back as a country. And 500 years went by, and the literalists were like, no, no, really. And people moved on. And then 700 years went by, no Israel. It was getting hard to be a literalist. God, when he, and what I mean by that is when God says something, he literally means it to be true. 
Now, people, some people say, we don't literally believe that when Jesus said he's a door, he's a door, do you? Well, no, obviously he was using a, a symbol, a metaphor. But is he, the, is he a door? Is he the entrance into heaven? Yes, he is. But obviously, we, you, you know, we're not idiots. We can tell the difference between symbolic language. But when God says, I'm going to rebuild a country and bring Jews back from all over the world to... Uh, Nails going, really, really, it's really true. And the others are like, you've got to be kidding me, dude. I mean, didn't we cover that a thousand years ago? I mean, read every church father for the last 1500 years, it's not going to happen. Just move on with your life. 1600 years, 1700 years, 1800 years, 1900 years. And then suddenly one day, Israel becomes a country. And there weren't that many literalists left. What's, but, you know, I have sympathy for those who are what I call, uh, and what others call, replacement theologians. I do have sympathy up to May 14th, 1948. I, I understand that if you... I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, you know, my chips on them. You know, I have sympathy to a degree for that. I think we should study the scriptures and say, well, if God says it, it's true. If we don't know when it's going to happen, we just say, I don't know. It doesn't mean it's not true. People were prophesying about the coming of the Messiah the first time for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then it happened. Why would we believe that if God prophesied that he's coming back again and certain things like the rebirth of Israel will happen as we get closer, why don't we think it would happen even though it takes a long time? So these are the issues. But after 1948, it does get a little challenging to wonder why do people stick with this? And uh, we're going to have a conference on this in just a few Why do people still believe this? Why does the majority of pastors and priests in the world today believe in replacement theology 64 years after the rebirth of Israel? And what difference does it make? Why is that significant? It is very significant, and we're going to talk about those issues at that conference. But that's just an example. Fulfilled prophecies are one of the, one of the ways we know that God's word is true. And, and I would use Israel as an example. If you are having a conversation, kids, in, you know, in school, or you're talking to someone in, in your family, and they're like, ah, you don't really believe in God, do you? One of the things you should say is, you know, have you ever heard of a country called um, Israel? And then take them to Ezekiel 36 and 37 and show them that 2,500 years... Point number three. Many countries are specifically mentioned in the Bible in end times Bible prophecy. But America is not one of them. The two most commonly, question, uh, commonly asked questions that I receive when I travel and speak all across the United States and even worldwide, the first, they kind of go back and forth depending on the time and what's happening in the news, but one of them is, Joel, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? I mean, really. I mean, didn't, aren't the Jews like opposed to Jesus? Well, that after Israel was reborn as a country in the future, then Jews would start coming back to the Lord. And that's what's happening. And that's very exciting, and my family is part of that. But the other question, and I would say overall this is the most asked question that I, I get, is, Joel, where is America in end times Bible prophecy? And there are variations on that. You know, is America in end times prophecy? And what happens to America in the last days? And, 
The answer to all of that is we're not in there. Now, in the book Implosion uh, that, that just came out a few uh, months ago, um, I, I, I answer this question. I go through some detail. And it wasn't that 9-11, you know, isn't the United States Babylon? Uh, and, and people have made, written books about this and made, a, you know, make, made their lives trying to explain to people that Babylon is the United States. But it's not. It's Babylon. You're like, well, what's, well, oh, you, mean, you mean London? No. I, you, you mean Moscow? No. Do you mean Rome? No. Do you mean the Catholic Church? No. What do you mean? I mean it's Babylon. <laughs> Babylon was an ancient city and an ancient nation and an ancient uh, region. And it's in the Middle East. It's in Iraq. And you say, well... Let's go over this again. Prophecy is saying that Babylon will come back in the last days and it will become the major center of commerce. Well, you don't really think that's going to happen. Yes, I do. Well, why? Because the Bible said so? <laughs> yeah, but, but there's, no, there's no prospect of Babylon becoming a city, a capital again. Well, did you know they're building it right now? Did you know that your taxpayer dollars are helping fund the building of the city of Babylon in Iraq right now? No, I'm not kidding. Under Secretary Clinton, they, they, uh, they dispatched money to help rebuild some of the ancient ruins in Babylon. Uh, the New York Times reported a few years ago. You're like, really? Yes, really. Well, it's not, it's not really the one in Revelation. Yes, it is. <laughs> Just because we're not there yet is more like we're in the 1930s or early 40s. We're at, if you were a believer at that time and you said, well, Israel's not a country yet. You said, well, yeah, but Jews are starting to come back. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> let's not be ridiculous, Joel. I was not born then, but let's just pretend I was. And let's pretend you were. And, and let's pretend it was 1942, let's say. And you're like, do you realize the Jews are being massacred in Europe? Yes, I realize that. Do you, and you're still sticking to the story that Israel's going to be coming back as a country. And right now, which there's a plan by the Iraqi government to rebuild now, and that's happening now, and we're actually helping to fund it, why do you say, well, it's not going to really happen. It is going to happen. Well, you say, when is it going to happen? I don't know. I'm not the prophet. I, the, I'm a non-prophet. And, and so <laughs> I can't give you all these answers. I'm just pointing to the things that the scriptures say to be true. And that's one of them. Now, there's lots of other countries mentioned in the Bible. Russia, Iran, uh, all kinds of, you know, India is mentioned in the Bible. Um, Sudan, Libya. But, but the United States is not in there. And so you say, well, so people ask me, all right, well, Joel. We're in the last days. Hmm, okay. By the way, the Apostle Peter said we were in the last days in Acts chapter 2. The Apostle John wrote that we were in the last hour. So we're not just in the last days, we're in the last milliseconds before Jesus comes back, metaphorically speaking. Okay? So, people say, okay, so we're in the last days, and, and isn't the United States the wealthiest, most powerful country on the face of the planet in the history of mankind? Well, yes, it is. And you're saying that it 
it's not an end times prophecy. That's what I'm saying. You're saying it has no role in the end times. Well, I'm sure it's not Babylon. Yes, I'm sure. Haven't we covered that? Okay. So, well, what happens to us, Joel? I mean, people are, some people are shocked. Some people are confused, but some people are offended. Joel, you're saying that we're not a defined player and that Turkey is a defined player? Yes. And that Russia has a role and Iran and Egypt and Syria and, and of course, Israel and, and the Roman Empire is going to re, be revived and and yet the United States doesn't have a role? That's right. Not a defined role. It's not saying, I'm not saying that we may not be a physical entity, a legal entity as a country, as we go deeper and deeper into the last days, but we're not defined, and a lot of countries are. So people ask. the question, well, well, let's go through some scenarios of what could happen. And, and now I want to take a few moments and describe just sort of where we are, because the, because the book Implosion, uh, the subtitle for this book is, Can America Recover from Its Economic and Spiritual Challenges in Time? Can America Recover from Its Economic and Spiritual Challenges in Time? We face enormous challenges, unprecedented in our history. We've faced difficult times in our history, and I write about that in the book. But this is something quite extraordinary. Think of it this way. Uh, if you've seen the debt clock... When my wife, Lynn, and I, we moved to Washington, D.C., when we got married, that was back in 1990. And the joke in Washington among political leaders at the time was, well, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon it adds up to real money. That was Washington political people's way of saying, ah, the, we, we waste a, little, a couple billion here, a couple billion here, it's rounding errors, yeah, nobody really notices. Billions, okay, you know, that's a lot of money, right? You'd like a billion, you'd like a billion. It just consider it a rounding error. I'll take a billion, right? That was the joke then. Now we're talking about trillions with a T. Now, let's put it this way. If down the debt, it would take, as I point out in the book, it, it would take about 32,000 years to get to one trillion. One trillion is about 32,000 seconds. Do the math. Now, we owe 16 trillion. And just to put this into context, you know, you think at first, like a dollar a second, that seems reasonable, right? But then you think, well, that would be way off. It wouldn't even practically do a dent in it, so I guess we'd have to do $16 a second, but right now, according to U.S. News and World Report magazine, just from a few weeks ago, it's not in the book because it came out after the book, but they did an analysis and they found out that the federal government last My friends, this is unsustainable. This is going to lead to fiscal implosion. Our country is going to collapse financially if we continue on this way, because it's not just the 16 trillion that we owe now. That's just what we owe now. Coming at us is $57 trillion in promises that the federal government has made to us regarding Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that the experts say we cannot afford, we cannot pay for. Politicians who knew they would be dead and buried 
made promises to us that they, they, that Fifty-seven, fifty-seven trillion feet high, let's say, we're on the ship of state and we're heading right towards those obligations. Okay? Now, you would th now, 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 some of you have saw the movie Titanic. Some of you saw it in 3D. I don't know why, but <laughs> you knew the story, you knew how it was going to play out. Okay, whatever. Now, in, even if you have not seen the movie, if you just have a general sense of history, you know that if you're on a ship and there's an iceberg ahead of you, you don't want to speed up. Okay? Now that's a fairly big... In the last years of President Bush, we were spending three to four hundred billion dollars extra every year than we brought in. So we had deficits of three to four hundred billion dollars in those last years of the Bush administration. Now I say this because I want to be, in this sense, bipartisan. This was a problem. This was a terrible problem. It, both parties were doing it, but I'm just saying, under President Bush, who had a lot of wonderful things to commend him about and other things people disagree terribly about. But on this case, just as a factual point, not a partisan point, three to four hundred billion dollars a year we were overspending. Now, under the current administration, that's one point two trillion dollars. spending about 40 cents on the dollar more than we have. Every dollar that we spend, 40 cents of it, we have to borrow from the Chinese or the Saudis or you know, other friendly um, allies to us. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a problem. So what we've done is we've, we're now going three to four times faster towards the debt icebergs than we were going before, and that was bad then. This is not sustainable. And we saw in 2008 the first tremors of an economic implosion when, the, when Wall Street began to melt down and you know the, the is now the, the new study came out uh, from the Federal Reserve showing that the average American family, average, normal, regular, average American family has lost 40% of its financial net worth since 2008. Any of you that have ever been to Disney and have gone on that Tower of Terror know what it feels like to drop really rapidly. Now that's a ride, it's a game. You, you, you stop eventually. And in this case, we, we went from here to here and people got sick and scared. And they're you know, looking around and thinking, is that going down again? That's scary. But the Lord in his mercy stopped the, the elevator from crashing to the bottom. Somebody's chumming the water where the surfers are. I mean, that's bad, right? We don't want to do that. People are scared, and, and, and rightly so. That's just the financial side, and I'm giving you just a snapshot of it. I, I go into more detail in the book. Now the moral side, the spiritual side, the cultural side. You know, it, it, we might collapse financially, but we're already imploding morally and spiritually. People say, well, you know, collapsing economically, that's a little hard. I, I don't know, Joel. Okay. Just look at, just think of the families around you that you know. I don't mean literally here, but you know, the families in your sphere of, uh, of influence in your, in your world. Think of 
How many families have melted? That, that these families are melting down, they're imploding. And I, I, I really hesitate and, and, and resist the idea that these are mini meltdowns that add up to something. If, if you're going through that, that's not a mini meltdown. That is the implosion of your world. And this is happening in record numbers. This is, you know, in the last 25, 30 years, we've seen more divorce, more meltdowns than ever. Now people say, well, in the last few years, uh, divorce numbers are starting to come down a bit. And well, yeah, that's because people are living together rather than getting married. Those numbers are skyrocketing. I mean, you have to make sure you're keeping the context. If you Violent crime in America? Since 1960, violent crime is up 463%. That's an explosion of violence. Now people say, well, you know, okay, that's, you know, that's the big cities, Joel. That, you know, New York, LA, Chicago, Washington, DC. You know, okay. okay. Do you realize that just a few weeks ago, after implosion came out, so I don't have this stat in the book, I'm just trying to keep up with the stats because they're coming out every couple weeks, the FBI came out with a report indicating there's a murder wave, a murder wave going on in small town America. I mean, there's murders, a murder wave going on in small towns? I mean, that's like, that's Mayberry RFD. That's where Andy Griffith and Aunt B and Opie live, right? I mean, that's, that's where Barney is. They don't have crime. And that's where our, you know, that's where our values are strong. No, it, it turns out that that's not the case. People are caught slaughtering each other in the streets in small towns in America. I just had the... Uh, honor, I guess is the way I put it, of, uh, of preaching a message very much like this one in a church in uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado, where in a few miles to one side, Um, the slaughter just happened, you know, a few, actually it was, happened to be just a couple weeks before I was uh, there to speak. And uh, the pastor of actually two Calvaries, um, the Calvary that's, that's close to Columbine, and, and then the Calvary pastor from Aurora, uh, both were hosting that event that night. And, and I walked through this stuff, and I said, you know, some people, there's this new study, there was a new poll out, that I think it said 62% of Americans think that the, you know, the Aurora massacre was an isolated incident. But just going online, I counted up at least, at least more than 70 school shootings or, or, or massacres of that in schools and other types of facilities just since Columbine. One of the reasons that America is experiencing, or, or let's say that America is facing a moral, spiritual, cultural, fiscal implosion, I mean, an outright collapse, I'm not talking about decline, but one of the reasons that America faces implosion is because of the epic failure of the church to make disciples. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, all authority 
in heaven and on earth has been given. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And behold, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. In other words, he'll take care of us. He'll be with us. He's not just sending us out uh, without help. He's, he's in charge. He loves us. He's all seeing. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. And he's saying, this is important to me. What you have learned from the word of God, what you know to be true about the gospel, about the, about the, the amazing power. teach them information in their head. Model it for them. Walk with them. Do for younger people, younger believers, Jesus saying, what I did for you guys, right? Jesus selected, he preached to thousands, but he chose prayerfully, as his father directed him, he chose 12 men. He didn't pick them from the top of society. He picked them, you know, from middle and maybe even down society. And people who, who were glad to be invested in by Jesus. Now, one of them rejected it all. One of them betrayed, right? That's, that's Judas. And it's because men are not machines. Eleven of them, well, did they turn out well? One of them betrayed Jesus right at the end of, you know, but, but when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, things began to click. All the things he'd shown them, all the things he'd taught him, them, all the things he'd modeled for them, it began to click in. And Jesus said in some of his final words, what I've done, I want you to go do. I made disciples of you all. Now I want you guys to go out and make disciples of others. This is very dear to Jesus' heart. You say, well, why did he want, why didn't he just tell them to go preach to as many millions as they possibly could? Well, they're supposed to, they're supposed to preach the gospel to all Christians. And Titus, older women are supposed to invest in younger women. Okay, we're not supposed to be discipling across genders. But one of the most amazing things is this is important to Jesus. And yet, many of us are going to get to heaven and tr we're truly born again and we're going to get to heaven. He's going to be glad to have us and he's going to say, fantastic, welcome to heaven. Show me some of your disciples. I'd like to meet them. And some of us are going to be saying, what? My what? I'm sorry, that was my trickier. What did you say? You know, your disciples. Your, your disciples, you're like, you know, go ye therefore. What, didn't you mean pastors were supposed to do that? You know, no, I, I said that was for everybody. Go and make disciples. <laughs> you must not be ridiculous. I, you didn't, I, I didn't know what that meant. Did you ask anyone? No. Did you search this out? Did you try to figure this out? No. Now, would you be rejected? Would I be rejected from being in heaven? No, we are saved by grace. We're saved in spite of the moronic things that we do. He forgives us. 
But when you're standing before Jesus face to face, is that, is that your plan? To say, I, 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 I. how to make one and have never done it. Now, Lynn and I were very fortunate in our spiritual lives because when we uh, met at Syracuse University, we had some people that discipled us. Uh, we were involved for, for a while in Campus Crusade for Christ, and there was a guy named Nick that took me under his wing and began to teach me uh, the, the Word, and he began to teach me how to share my faith. I'd shared my faith some in high school, but, but he tried to help me do it better, and, and I loved that. And there was a woman named Debbie who took Lynn under her wing and began to have her in her Bible study, but didn't just teach her, modeled things for her, began to take her, took her out and to share the gospel and lead people to the Lord and then to help them. Now, Dr. Koshi is the one who just passed away uh, yesterday morning at, at 12.52 uh, a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And that's, uh, that's, we, we knew he was sick. I had gone to see him twice over this past year. Uh, there he is. We were preaching on a preaching tour through India, Dr. Koshi on the left, and that's me. And then that's his son, uh, Pastor Jay Koshi. Uh, I love this man. And he invested, he and his wife invested in our lives. And we literally, we would been working on a book, which comes out next week, called The Invested Life, Making Disciples of All Nations, One Person at a Time. And he never got to see this book, the final edition. Uh, it had just arrived. Together. We preached all over this country, and he was more like the Apostle Paul to me than any person I've ever known. He really was an extraordinary man, and if you, if you read the book, The Invested Life, um, uh, you'll get a sense of that. Each chapter kind of walks through what discipleship means, how to do it, lots of practical examples, but in between each chapter is uh, some testimonies of how he got discipled, who, who, were, who was the spiritual influence for him. Who was the Apostle Paul in his life? And then how did he transfer that to others? How did he transfer that to me? And how did he and his wife transfer it to Lynn? And, and how we then have been making disciples. And we start, I want to leave you. Powerfully, that it was more dramatic, more sweeping, more transformative than the first great awakening of the early 1700s when millions of Americans turned to faith in Jesus Christ and were revived. People who were believers but weren't taking it that seriously got serious about their faith. It would have to be more transformative, more sweeping than the second great awakening of the early to mid 1800s, which was even more exciting than the first one. We need a third Great Awakening. We can't know for certain if that's going to happen. It's not like you can put quarters into the vending machine, push third Great Awakening, and the Reese's Pieces pops out, right? that we're spending too much money. It's not just that we're slaughtering each other in the streets. We have killed almost 54 million babies in our country since 1973. 54 million. Now, close, we'll be getting close to, we're, we're approaching rapidly 60 million. I was just at Auschwitz. Now, for a Jewish guy to stand in a gas chamber in Auschwitz, the Nazi death camp, 
a lot was going through my mind, but one of the things that was going through my mind at that moment was we are approaching 60 million babies that we've killed in our country. And if we hit that number, we'll be at 10 times the number we think God is going to be with a nation that is killing 10 times more than the Nazis did. If you think that judgment is not coming to our country, if you think that we're not going to implode as a country, when you look at all this data and so much more, the fact that we now, the pornography industry in America now makes more money than ABC, CBS, and NBC combined. Some of you are contributing to that. And I'm saying we're in deep trouble. And one of the reasons we're in deep trouble is because older believers... ...congregations in America, give or take. Most of them, I would argue, certainly many, but I would think most, the light is dimming. In many, the light has gone out entirely. And that's because people who know Christ aren't investing in the next generation. Implosion describes the big picture. Uh, the invested life describes the little picture how you can begin to walk this out and begin to be faithful, at least in your family, in your world. And by the way, if you're discipling your children, amen. But you know, that's not enough. Jesus said, go and make... and make disciples here and now, and then say, Lord, where might be I be able to do this in another country or countries to be faithful to you? Because you're coming back. You're coming back, and I'm going to stand before you one day. I might get raptured. That's my hope. <laughs> or I might go home to be with the Lord like Dr. Koshi did 48 hours ago. But either way, we're in our last days. We don't know individually how much time we have. We all think we've got a lot, but we just don't know. At some point very soon, you and I are going to be standing before Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. All seeing, all... Not to get saved, but once we're saved, to give all that we have, all that we are, all that we own, all that we know, all our time to Jesus. And we're going to stand before him. And the question is, is Jesus going to say to you and to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. And now, in the millennial kingdom, I will put you in charge of more things. Enter into the joy of your master. The invest in life begins with this question. And I'll close on that, and then we'll take some questions from you. are you investing in? Those are the two questions that every Christian needs to be able to answer according to the scriptures. And we paraphrase it a little bit differently, but just to make it clear sort of in our own context, number one, who is investing in you? And number two, whom are you investing in? 
Another way to put it is, who is your Apostle Paul? We all need an older, wiser follower of Christ to invest in us. Even if we're a reasonably mature believer, we need someone who, who keeps us accountable, who encourages us, who, who challenges us, who helps us to go further and deeper, more fruitful. But we also need a Timothy. We need fault why America is in the problem we're in. 85% of Americans say we're Christians. 84% believe that the Bible is the word of God. And yet we're in this crisis. Something is disconnecting. People are saying they're Christians, but they're not. They're saying they believe in the Bible, but they're not living by the Bible. Why? The epic failure of discipleship. This is our moment, and I don't know how much time we have. But we need a third great awakening. We need sweeping spiritual revivals. We need to get back to discipleship. And that may not save our country, but at least we as individuals will be able to stand before Christ, having pleased him, having been obedient to him, and hear from his lips. Do we want to stand for just a moment? <laughs> just stretch a little bit. If you want to, if you have a question, you can line up down the uh, aisle here. Stretch a little bit. Okay, be seated. <laughs> question? And I think just to put context, I, I went a little over, so I'm thinking maybe if we could just go to, if people can stay till 9.15, we'll, we'll do questions till then. If you can't, obviously, okay. you know. We'll go until 9.15, and uh, Joel will be over... Uh oh, goodness. Um, the short version, uh, Chrislam, this is the... The sort of mixing of Christianity and Islam. Uh, these are people who are saying that uh, actually, you know, Islam and Christianity are actually pretty similar, and they focus so much on the similarities uh, that they blur the differences, and there are enormous differences. Um, it's wrong. It's heresy. Um, and and the sad thing is, uh, a lot of people who are even missionaries or people who are trying to reach Muslims are using this. Well, we're not so different in a view of trying to convince Muslims that actually you could consider Christianity. It's completely the wrong way to go, and it's really tragic because more and more A billion plus people, this is now not the time to say, it's really not so bad, we are all one big happy family. Now, we can be loving and kind in how we share the gospel, but I write in a book called Inside the Revolution about how the millions and millions of followers of uh, Islam are leaving Islam and becoming followers of Jesus Christ. And it's part of God's amazing love for the people of Iran and Egypt and Sudan and, and all the other countries of the world that he is drawing Muslims out of Islam into Christianity. And this is what this show at the heart of it, it, it it's, a, it's a fissure, a weakness, a crack really the way to get to heaven, then you sort of want to 
soften it and round it down and just not make it more palatable. Palatable, it's medicine. You don't want to water down medicine. You want the, the medicine to get in there and start to work and change people. And so this is the wrong time. But that's why I believe that, that some people are watering down the gospel towards Muslims is they don't really believe it's transformative. They don't really believe that it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And so they're backpedaling. And this is just a, a strange time to backpedal when millions of people are going, thank God I got out of Islam and I came to Christ as the Savior. His reasoning being that he doesn't agree with all the moral decisions of Israel as a nation. And I think that even in your blog today, um, it was entitled, Israeli Rabbi Calls for God to Wipe Out and Destroy Iran. Yeah. Um, but my the rabbi was wrong, but that's what he said. Yeah. So I, I pointed out that he was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jesus, Jesus said, love your enemies. And we should be praying for the gospel to get communicated to all of Iran and all the people of the Middle East, not to wipe them out. Would we like their regime to fall? Yes. And then they can all come to Jesus too. But, and we want their nuclear program to be neutralized? Absolutely. Or dismantled by them? That'd be even better. So it's not that we're turning a blind eye to evil, but we don't want to be called. So 100% of the time, no matter what, and what are the implications of this? Um, you know, these the are great States. questions, and I, I don't mean to dodge it, but I am from Washington, <laughs> D.C. No, the, these are exactly the questions that we're going to answer in just a couple weeks at the Epicenter Conference. Now, if we're raptured before then, well, it won't even matter. Uh, <laughs> and, if, and if you go home to be with heaven, uh, you know, uh, before then, then you'll know the answer. But I'm going to save those answers for that conference, because that's exactly why we're talking about these things. We're going to talk about what, is God's, what does the Bible say from the Old Testament and New about Israel? Why do we believe that there is a plan and purpose for Israel, that God doesn't mean replacement theology? And what does God say in the scriptures about September 12th. So epicenterconference.com, and then we'll answer those questions in full. Thank you. Hello, Joel. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, Hawaii. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you coming uh, to visit us. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. So my, my question is, uh, how does quantitative easing affect our, us financially? How, how does quantitative easing? Yes. Well, <laughs> okay. Okay, you guys can all sit down. We're just going to spend the next 25 minutes on... Uh, uh, the doctoral dissertation of quantitative easing. Look, the, the short version of that is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, printing a lot more money uh, so that you... today. So you had a glass of pineapple juice. It's, you know, and it's fresh and you're like, fantastic. That's, mm, that is a glass of pineapple juice. But now you say, okay, but we got a lot of people to give pineapple juice. Should we really make more pineapple juice? Should we get more pineapples and squeeze them? Why don't we just water it down, put water in it, and it'll look like pineapple juice. And it's not, it's not as good as the other, the fresh kind, but, uh, and you start watering it down. And then people say, well, that's disgusting. I, I don't want that. I want the real thing. And so they say, I want 50 glasses of pineapple juice to get the same amount of pineapple juice that was in the one glass originally. The, it, the watering down of the currency is going to lead to inflation. Because if you're...
And, uh, but he, he made, I love Steve, and, I, and he makes a great point about the currency. He says, you know, a, a dollar, or, or, the currency is, is a standard of measure, standard of measurement, right? Now, we have 12 inches in a foot. We don't say, well, this week it's 13 inches. But you now in this country, it's 8.37. I mean, this gets kind of ridiculous. And we say, well, we need more feet in the world. Well, well, let's just cut the, how about if we cut the foot down to six inches, then we got twice as many. No, that, that doesn't make any sense. It has to be a standard of measurement. The dollar should be standard. It shouldn't waffle or waver a little bit less, a little bit more. That's not right. And it's going to lead to inflation. I just had a question in uh, 1 Peter 5, uh, 13, uh, he refers to that there, um, has where they are writing from, I believe, and um, just curious as to what your take is on that. Jesus, in Babylon, yeah. Well, that's in dispute. Uh, some people say that it was, uh, that, that there were people actually who traveled to Babylon. Some of the, uh, the apostles had. Apostle Thomas, for example. Other people say, no, that was uh, Rome, and they were using as a code. about uh, Iraq and why I believe that Babylon is really Babylon from Iraq. One of the reasons is because in the context of the chapters that talk about Babylon in the future, it talked about things like the Euphrates River that in Revelation, for example. And, uh, in fact, uh, just as an example... So in, in, in Revelation 16, for example, that's uh, where... come up that way, and then it's the very next chapter that talks about the doom of Babylon. So the context is, I mean, are, are we saying that that river is really the Tiberia River, whatever it's called, in, in, in Rome? I mean, you know, there are a lot of linkages here and in Isaiah and in, and in, um, and in uh, Jeremiah, which are specifically linked to the, the, the physical geography of what we now know as Iraq, uh, the nation of uh, Babylon. One other point, just, you know, uh, the prophecies in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Revelation is a sudden cataclysmic des destruction of Babylon. That's not what happened in the... We have to see a literal rebuilding of Babylon and then a literal destruction of Babylon, and that's going to be in the last days. Uh, I, I, we don't have time for a follow-up tonight, but I appreciate it. But uh, you can email it to me. While we, uh, don't, we, we certainly aren't to put our trust in political leaders, it seems that the church is averse in getting involved in the, in the political arena. And should not a church leaders and, and pastors educate their flock in the issues? Currently, the church seems all over the map in this specific election, and yet it seems so clear just on the issues of things like abortion. And uh, it seems like the church would be unified. Uh, 
I mentioned this the other night. And I'm out, I'm clean. Uh, this time of year I have a, you know, I wear a patch. Uh, not, not, not literally, but okay, you know, so it's metaphoric. But um, I describe what I mean by that. What I mean by that is I, I try, I'm trying very hard by the grace of God not to be a partisan advocate in this season of my life. Why? Because I don't believe that one approach is better than the other? No, I, I do believe that. In the book I describe that I've changed my views over the years, uh, I grew up in a family of Jews, so they were Democrats. And before them, they were Democrats. And before them, they were Bolsheviks in Russia. So, you know, we have this tradition. Um, I changed my view. political activity in a direct way. And the reason is because God has taken me out of it. There was a season of my life. Uh, he taught me a lot. I learned a lot. But he's saying, listen, Joel, if, you're, if, if my calling on your life now is to share the gospel with Jews, share the gospel with Muslims, teach Bible prophecy, I don't know if adding partisan Republican conservative politics to your portfolio is really the best you know, way to do it because that's going to divide an awful lot of people. And you've already got very controversial issues that you're talking about. And that's true. Now, and also, I was not that good at politics. You know, all my guys lost. So, you know, um, some people have said, you know, could then you have uh, helped the opponent? And I say, you know, some people are really not supposed to get involved in partisan politics at all. Past, some pastors, for example, their calling from the Lord is preach the gospel, make disciples, and make sure that from the pulpit, as well as the rest of your life, you're not doing anything to keep people from the other party or other ideologies from coming and, be, and giving the gospel a fair hearing. If you're so partisan, some people won't be able to stomach that, Right? Uh, I described the story of how my wife was discipling several young women, and one of them, at this point when I was a conservative, Republican, I mean, I was at every convention and every, you know, and she was a hard... Preach Republican conservatism to her or Jesus. There's a difference. And, and, and so I walk through a number of scenarios. Now, there's others. I want to be clear. We're at a huge turning point in our country, a, a crossroads. This is a critical election. One of the things I say is you absolutely, absolutely must register to vote and you must vote. And you better take a lot of people to vote too. Now, you say, well, our votes don't count. No, this is between you and Jesus. We don't live in a, a, a country where, it, where it's a dictatorship. You have a responsibility that, you've been, that we've all been given to do what you believe between you and the Lord you should do. Now, yes, you should start. Uh, because Congressman Paul Ryan just gave his big address accepting the vice president nomination. Now, I just, again, for putting my cards on the table. So Paul and I know each other. We worked together at an organization that was run by Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett. And we were young. We were kids. I mean, I was, I don't know, 24, thereabouts. He was, I think, 22. I mean, we were fresh out of school, basically. And we had shared, you know, we had cubicles right next to each other. And it's kind of interesting to see that God, well, I, God has taken my life out of politics, and we who basically were on the same track, uh, very passionate about ideas, less passionate about a party, but more about ideas at that point in our life, 
you know, now God's using me to preach the gospel, and he's nor could I have fathomed that because he is so good on fiscal issues that, that he would get chosen to be the VP. I did not see that coming. This is just another proof that I'm a non-profit and, 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 and not a profit. So, um, so I just want to be clear about that, that that's why I quote him extensively in the book. It's not some secret thing. Um, these are critical issues, and I do believe you need to take them seriously. And when I say semi-flippantly, I or it sounds that way, I've gone through political detox, I do not mean that these aren't important and you shouldn't be involved in some way, shape, or form. But you need to know what is the Lord saying to you. You need to be faithful to what God is telling you to do based on the scriptures. And I'll... And And he was to govern in a civil, civic society, right? That was his job. That, he was jo his job was to be a political leader, a governor, and a good one. Ezra was called to be the priest. To, he, his job was to read the word of God, preach the word of God, believe the word of God, uh, uh, help people understand and follow the word of God. Now, Nehemiah was a godly man, a prayer warrior. He fasted and prayed, and he saw God move powerfully. Ezra had an entirely different calling. It, they work together. It, we live in a body in, in the kingdom of Christ. And, and, and we are ambassadors. So we have a role. And sometimes God calls us into... Right? Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt as a Jew. Wow. So we need to not say, oh, that government, we don't want to be involved at all. Because then other values are going to get, uh, they're going to lead with other values. But you just have to know between you and the Lord, what is he telling you to do and me to do? Okay, not a sermon, just a thought. Okay, a few more questions and we'll try to give, I'll try to give faster answers if you don't ask such complicated questions. <laughs> I just want to um, mention that um, the watering down, because um, what about the text? Um, different manuscripts making money today. Different, I'm sorry, different, say, different say the manuscripts last manuscripts of the Bible. Like you can How valuable are they? They're valuable. I, I mean, I think it's important to check, uh, you know, prophecy and read it in, in all scripture and read it in different translations. One of the websites I really love is BibleGateway.com and also BlueLetterBible.com. They allow me to look at the text. Um, I'm not a Greek scholar, but with Blue Letter, for example, you can really go in and see what are the Greek words. It's linked to Strong's Concordance, uh, if I can't pronounce the Greek, which I can't, it even has a little button I can push and it says Strong's G 5341, you know, and Hakoya or whatever. You know, I don't, can't do it, but the kids and I like to say Strong's G 5324 or whatever. And uh, so it helps me and it helps to use. about prophecy, each word is important. And each, you know, you, you can't, each piece of the puzzle is critical. And so it's important to, to, uh, to, to go with a version like that. But I also test it against other translations. Um, I highly recommend that. Okay. 
Joel, in your opinion, uh, why do you think the American Jewish community predominantly votes Democratic? <laughs> well, uh, why does it? Oh, goodness. <laughs> You're not making easy that for me, people. <laughs> what time is my flight home? No. Uh, look, uh, you know. right thing. But we, we, have, we have blinders over our eyes. Now, by saying that, you're immediately going to go, oh, so you're saying about the Democrats and Republicans, look, I've already put my cards on the table about those issues. You know where I was, you know where I am. But my point is, we need to pray for the Jewish people, not about whether they'll vote for you know, your particular political party or ideological persuasion. That's not the issue. The issue is Jews are lost. And our team is going to hell, like everybody else who doesn't know Jesus, until we know Jesus. But we need to know Jesus, and Gentiles need to share the gospel with us. And, and, and our goal with people shouldn't be... a person's political views are a lagging indicator of what they believe spiritually at their core. It's a lagging indicator. And in my case, when I, all right, just a quick little story. Uh, when I got married, you know, Lynn and I went on our honeymoon. We went to Bar Harbor, Maine. Bar Harbor. That's a long way from here, by the way. That's uh, many time zones. So we went up there, and, and so she said, you know, I guess we're moving to Washington, so I guess I ought to register to vote. I said, register to vote? You never register to vote? She says, no. I said, why not? I don't know. Our, our family didn't think it was that important. And here is I register. Uh, what you should do. But let me give you, a, I'll give you a little test and see if you're a liberal or a conservative, then you can make your own choice. I thought, you know, that she'll become a Democrat like me and then we'll all be good. And so, uh, so I, I, I thought up 20 questions or so and I'm, I couldn't believe it. She came out to be a 98.967 rock solid conservative. And I thought, how did this not come up when we were dating? What is happening here? I, I, this is my, I was like the third, fourth day of my, day of my uh, our, our honeymoon. I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> Should I even tell her that I went to heckle Dan Quayle? I mean, what? I this. So I came home from work uh, and she had, was getting the apartment ready and I, I, she greeted me with a big button that said that had Reagan Bush 84 bringing America back. <laughs> the wind had gotten knocked out of me. And then I looked in the apartment and everything was red, white, and blue bunting and there was all these flags and all these Republican like, like you know, elephants and stuff. I thought, okay, okay. So I closed the door. I said, uh, could, could, could we go over this again? I said, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor. I didn't say for Republican. You know, because I'm Jewish. And I, and I think the Republicans are mean and heartless and they, and they eat children. And so, you know... <laughs>
Republican Party at the time, and I, I didn't believe in you know, no new taxes and breaking those pledges, and I had a lot of issues with the Republicans, and they were legitimate issues. But, but what she did in her own sweet, loving way, and, and I don't, she wasn't trying to do this, it's just we were having you know, a newlywed discussion, she was just trying to understand, well, what do you believe at your core, and, and is there a party that best represents you on that issue? Not perfectly, this is you know, a sinful world, but where do you line up? And, I, and for me, I realized I, would, I had a caricature of both parties. I felt more sophisticated intellectual with one, and I thought the other guys were morons and blue blood. Kids who watch too much Animal Planet say that bats aren't that blind anyway, but okay. <laughs> My point is, if we don't understand who Jesus is, it's unlikely that we're going to understand other th spiritual, moral issues with the clarity that the Bible would, would provide for us, right? Now, you shouldn't necessarily need to believe in Jesus to believe that, it, it, that, that David wrote in the Psalms that God knit us together in our mother's womb, and therefore it seemed, you know, it would be horrifying to rip that apart and call that choice. That's, but, but, we, but somehow we've elevated Jews, but also, you know, it's not just Jews, but I'm, you, your question, we've elevated certain things like... It's going to be hard to hold to basic truths like God made life. If you believe that we evolved, then what does it really matter? You know, so that's an extended DVD answer. Um, and I know it doesn't fully get to the heart of it, but, but, but I think that is the heart of it. It doesn't describe all the details. I hope that's helpful. We'll do one more. Okay, one, one more. more question. First of all, I want to thank you for your obedience in what you're doing and especially in the books you've written. Oh, thank you. Second of all, is what's happening in Syria right now part of end time prophecy? I don't know, but um, as I mentioned on uh, Monday night, I've It's going to be burned down, it's going to be destroyed, it's, you know, it's pretty bleak. But it doesn't give a lot of context. Now, I just literally today was working on edits in the rain, not while well, I was inside, but because it was raining, um, on my next novel, which will be the last in this particular series that I've been working on. This one is called The Damascus Countdown. And it's, uh, it uh, will come out, Lord willing, in March of next year. But, but it's about how a preemptive strike on Israel... I'm sorry, on Iran by Israel could set into motion events that could bring about the fulfillment of those prophecies and thus the destruction of Damascus. We don't know how it's going to. exist and that they're going to come true and that they could come true in our lifetime we don't know how but we need to we need to know that they exist and we need to ask ourselves so what in other words if Damascus is going to be destroyed it could happen as a result of the massive bloodshed and carnage and evil that's being done by the Syrian regime right now if that's the case we might not be that far off from the destruction, the supernatural destruction of Damascus. And if that's the case, 
The question is, knowing that and ahead of time, because we've read and studied the prophecies, what are you and I doing to reach... You can't just bless Israel. The Bible says we need to bless Israel and her neighbors. Uh, because Jesus said, love your neighbors and love your enemies. So one of the projects we did a few years ago, uh, I, I don't have the time to tell this whole story, but the, the short version is an Arab woman who's the, one of the top newscasters in Syria, she came to faith in Jesus Christ. It's very exciting. And uh, then she decided, she started reading the New Testament and thought, oh my gosh, Syria is all over this book. I mean, Paul comes to Christ on the road to Damascus, and the first Christians are called Christians in Antioch, a Syrian city. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, I think, is preaching the gospel. news, I mean, it is 2,000 years old, but I'll make a docudrama about the life of Saul coming to faith in Christ and becoming Paul on the road to Damascus, and, and I'll do a, a real classic documentary, very well documented, and then we'll cut away to sort of narrative, uh, sort of uh, drama, dramatic scenes showing these events to happen. So she, she and her colleagues, uh, Christian Arabs in Syria, made this film, and then they thought, well, what are we doing? We can't just show this film. We live in Syria. <laughs> uh, we got to have to get permission from the, the, the president, President Bashar al-Assad. The guy's a butcher. So, well, she didn't say that, but I mean, so... <laughs> film and the president watched it and he was intrigued and you and by the way that they she had named it not how a jew comes to jesus in syria that would be a bad title <laughs> right what she did was she called it damascus um he uh, he entered a terrorist he left an apostle was the subtitle and that was kind of an intriguing thought so damascus so he watched and and, and the advisor said this the president was very impressed with how this film shows the historic role of damascus and so he would be honored for you to show premiere this film in his private movie theater now the the, the woman was like i'm sorry who is this really <laughs> but of culture, we'll be in charge of the whole thing, we will pay for everything, we will invite all the Muslim scholars and all the businessmen and the cabinet, and you give us a list of all the Christians you want to invite, and on May, or I think it was March 2nd, uh, 2009, I think it was, uh, we will show the film and a big, big event, and they're like, wow, and that happened, and when that happened, then they got permission to make DVD copies and, and distribute them all over Syria. And we got asked at the Josh Fund, would you be willing to finance uh, several hundred thousand copies? And so in the course of it, I think we did 460,000 copies at a dollar each. Uh, at that time, I think it was the biggest ticket item.
exciting what happened. And it shows that we need to pray for our neighbors and pray for our enemies. Yes, we don't want that regime to kill people. But in the meantime, since we don't, as Christians, have much influence over that, we need to help our brothers and sisters share the gospel, make disciples, give everyone in Damascus and all of Syria and all of the region an opportunity to hear and receive Christ, to hear the gospel and receive Christ before it's too late. Because these prophecies indicate that in the not too distant future, all kinds of terrible things are going to happen in that region to Israel's neighbors and enemies. And we need to make sure that when we stand before Jesus, he doesn't say, To help us financially, we would love for your prayers, for your financial support. It's tax deductible. You go to joshuafund.net. Again, joshuafund.net and get a sense of what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. And, I, uh, and then next year, if you want to come to Israel, we would love to take you. If it's still there, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do a tour in Israel next June. Uh, late June, I think it's the 25th or 27th, and then do an epicenter conference there. If these guys are doing a tour to Israel, go on theirs instead. Uh, but, uh, but take an opportunity and pray about going to Israel uh, to see what God is doing. Not just what he did thousands of years I hope it was helpful. I hope it was helpful. So let's close in prayer. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. I would encourage you to say yes. Why don't we close our eyes and bow our heads and just uh, have some, uh, some private time as we close tonight. But if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior, if you've never done that or you're just not sure if you ever have, raise your hand and let me just lead you in a prayer right now. And if you're someone who's already made a decision for Christ, I want you to be thinking about, am I walking with him? Am I making disciples? Am I pleasing him? Lord, give me a revival in my own life, my own family. Uh, really died on the cross to pay the penalty for all of your sins, and that God raised him from the dead to prove that he really is the Messiah. And if that's something you'd like to do tonight, I don't want you to leave this place without having had that opportunity. So if anyone would like to raise their hands, I'm going to pray now. Um, just give you a few more moments. Just raise it up high so I can see it. All right. Okay. Wonderful. I see those hands. And if anyone else wants to make that decision, last chance for at least to pray with me. I'm not here to coerce you, just to give you that opportunity. Anyone else want to make that decision tonight? Just raise your hand up so I can see it. Okay? Okay, we're going to pray. You can just pray in your heart or out loud if you want. Just pray along with me. Dear Father, I need you tonight. I admit that I've been going my own way. And I'm sorry. Sorry. 
Please change me, Lord. Please forgive me. And I believe, Father, that you raised Christ from the dead to prove to me that he really is the way and the truth and the life and the only way to get to heaven, to get to you. And so right now, Lord, by faith, by trust, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Please forgive me. me into your family. Thank you for giving me the Bible to guide me as your words. And I pray that you would just guide me now and help me to please you. And I look forward to spending eternity with you in heaven. And I pray these things in the name of my Savior and my Lord and my King who is coming soon. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless you. Amen. Why don't we stand for a moment?